Hey people, this is DJ. And this is Ish. And, and this, this is, is season four, four of Better, Better Let, Let Me, Me Tell You. you. Yes, it's like I just see like all this movement. <laughs> when I move, the earth shakes. Wait, that's a song. I yes, move. by Carol King. I feel the earth move under my feet. Oh, you know it's on tapestry. Probably still on the Billboard 100. It's a little too white for me, but we love Carol King. Listen, I, I'll I'm, I have no problem with tapestry. It's probably still you know number one somewhere. Yeah, I mean <laughs> tapestry. That's the one that had like all these songs, right? Yeah, like, like every, you make me feel everything was like actually. A hit. You know what song I like? You know what song I really like from Carol King what? is the one Gloria Stefan redid. It's too late. Oh, baby, it's too late yeah. now. It's too well. With that note, yes. See how we tied it back s- to Gloria singing, singing Gloria <laughs> Stefan remakes of Carol King Carole songs. King songs. <laughs> Welcome to episode one forty three. One forty three. Yes. How is everybody? Pedro Friday. Yes, it's a fantastically. It's gonna be a long weekend. Oh, yeah, it is. Yay! So, yeah. yay, you get an extra day to just lounge and do nothing. El Dia de los Enamorados. El Dia de los Enamorados. Um, President's, President's day. day. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it's like, okay. You, and that's nice, because if you have Monday off, you know, you can go out for dinner and have a little bit to drink, maybe stay in. Also, como la, el Valentín, every place is packed. You can do a later dinner. And not worry about having to wake up the next day to go to work. Yeah, but then, you know, Valentine's Day, like... Restaurants are so like blah, like full and. That's true. Oh, well, not this year, probably. <laughs> well, I take that back. I take that back. And they're probably gonna be at fifty percent capacity if nothing so, else. <laughs> welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Happy, yeah, happy uh, Friday. Happy Friday. Happy, happy Valentine's Day. Happy, happy de todo, everything. De todo un poco. Happy, 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 happy. So, oh yeah. this is I feel the week of viral videos. It, right. First of all, I want to let you know that I am not a German Shepherd. Okay, I am not an ocelot. Oh, okay. Yes, just so we're clear. <clears throat> so we're making reference to <laughs> what everybody probably saw this week. The thing about the lawyer. I'm not a cat. What I, I think is I funny. I love it. That is one of the fastest videos that went viral. Because I like the same day, right? I mean. Dude, I like, I got it like midday like everybody else. Oh, so it happened in the morning? Yeah, right. by 12. And it was... by the six o'clock news, they were putting it on the yeah, six o'clock yeah, news. Yeah, yeah. They spoke about it on The View. Like, I, I was it. like, Coño, I know things that go viral go viral quick, but this was like lightning. Okay, speed. you know, during a pandemic, viral goes quicker. So, you know, it's really funny. So, <clears throat> back in my litigation days, mm-hmm. um, sometimes, you know, people did have to appear telephonically, right? Right, digital, virtually. <clears throat> no, telephonically. That's what like, it was called. Most courtrooms are. No, really telephonically. No, no. Most courtrooms are t- equipped with like um, a phone system oh, oh, okay, where you okay. can call in and, and like there's a speaker, a speaker there, okay. like a speaker phone. Okay, okay. There's a speaker there. Um, and, you know, if for whatever reason, counsel can make it or whatever, mm-hmm. they could appear telephonically. Okay. And again, it's, it's pretty much a conference call, right? Yeah. The, the judge is there. One of the parties is there. You know, the, the person that appeared telephonically, there's a speaker. So they speak and you could hear them. Right. And then obviously there's a microphone and they could hear you. Right. right. That's very, very rudimentary technology, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, existed. That's, that's basic. Okay. Yeah. That, that was always an issue. Really? Either the person couldn't hear or we couldn't hear the person because in most, and I'm sure you've done it too, a lot of times when you have to do like a business call, you have to call into like a number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah like um, a group call or something. Yeah. A group probably call into a number. Mm-hmm. There was always an issue. So that's why when this whole thing with the pandemic started and court hearings started to go virtual, I was like, do it. <laughs> do it. And you know, a lot of attorneys... You know, they're older and, and maybe That's they're true. not as savvy with technology. That's I was true. like, do it. I know that some of the first like telephonic hearings that in you know in our office we attended were like a nightmare. Right. So this whole thing I just thought was like, Well, yeah, I'm sure of course this is happening this is... all the time. What I think is funny I loved it. What I think is funny is that who released that? I thought the same thing. So, so listeners, for those of you who, who I, I don't know where you've been, because it's been everywhere. So it was a, a, a Zoom call, mm-hmm. right? 
It was four little squares, and the bottom square has a lawyer who somehow managed to have a filter of himself, like, as a cat. Yes, so all you saw was a white was cat. Was a cat talking. But I loved it, because it's like, when he would look away, like, the cat's eyes would move, and sometimes the little mouth would be like, ooh! Yeah. So it was hilarious. Jose yeah. estaba la risa. Yeah, and the, the judge was like, sir, I think you have a filter. Right. And, and then, of course, the line everybody said, well, I'm live, and I'm, I'm not, not a, a cat. cat. Like, oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I thought Garfield had yes, gone to Harvard. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty awesome. But and yeah, who released it? Is, who released is, it? Is my question. Because I wouldn't think the cat released it. Well, I mean, the, the yes. judge didn't release it. Maybe opposing counsel was a dick. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, man. <laughs> you know what though? Maybe, maybe the cat released it himself. Like you know those times when you see people post things on like you know YouTube or TikTok or Instagram. And it's somebody like doing a fail mm-hmm. of like filming themselves. They mm-hmm. still post it, you know, because even yeah. they're in on the joke. So yeah. maybe, maybe it was that. Yeah. So then that went viral. And the other thing that went viral was the Gorilla Glue. <laughs> but yeah, I feel bad for her in the sense of what she's had to go through for a yeah. month. Pero que estupido. No, you know what? I feel bad for her because, okay, we could talk all day long about her bad judgment. <laughs> yes. But I don't think anybody <laughs> expected for her to be... Her hair had she had to undergo like surgery, like, like, surgery yeah, in yeah. a way. They had, she was like a, and they had to come up with like a treatment for her hair to be so able to get it. Here, here's out. you know one of the things we always, you know one of the things that we always discuss. Mm. Okay, we all make errors and we all have laps of judgment. And, right, you know right, we right, all right. nobody's perfect. Know, right, what made her think? At what moment did she See, say? Because here's the thing. She had a bottle of Gorilla Glue. So for those who don't know, this is this is a, a lady from Louisiana who was doing her hair. And she had run out of, of hairspray. hairspray. So she ran out of hairspray. And she thought it was a good idea. To put Gorilla to Glue put in her To put Gorilla hair. Glue. And I have seen, because I've, I've read up a couple things, that when they asked, like, what was her thinking is because it said multi-use. Okay. But here's my thing about that. Gorilla Glue is sold only at like Home Depot or Lowe's or stuff like that. At most Michaels. No, they don't even sell it at no, Michaels. No, it's not like no, a craft that's thing. Not, it's not a craft thing. Oh, it's okay, like a, okay. Gorilla Glue is used for like construction. Oh, okay. See, I didn't, I didn't yeah. know. It, especially like she had the spray one. Yeah. Because Gorilla Glue has several like different variations of Gorilla Glue. There's okay. one that's like a, a tacky glue like Elmer's, just stronger. Okay. She had the spray one. Right. Right? Gorilla Glue... I can't believe we're talking about this. <laughs> what, what, like, I want to know is like, okay, why did she have the gorilla? Glue if she had a, the gorilla glue at her house, right? Which I am assuming she did. I'm assuming she didn't go and buy gorilla glue because right. otherwise she would have just bought the hairspray, right? Correct, correct. So that, that let's get that out of the way. Okay, okay. So the gorilla glue is in the house. Now, generally, you buy Gorilla Glue for something in specific. Right. So se she, me rompió esto. Ella tuvo un proyecto. Tengo un liqueo aquí. Right. You know, esto se, esta madera se partió. I have to glue it. You know, like... Se está cayendo chico. A heavy duty... I mean, I bought Gorilla Glue as well. Like, I bought Gorilla Glue for chairs. Okay, okay. Right? So you know when you're buying Gorilla Glue what it is for. Right. It's not a, like a, you went and bought a, Elmer's. Right. For, for Aside example. that it's... That it's you only, they only sell it at Home Depot, you know, they don't sell it at like Sally Beauty Supply or Ulta, <laughs> right? Um, uh, you know, oh, and no. when they mean multi use, it means that you could use it on like wood, a chair. on a ch- uh, like cement, a, a pipe, on, like you know, like metal, <laughs> metal? Like, right? You right, know, right, plastic, not, not to s- not, not as hairspray, not as hairspray. I'm assuming that's so, not like, it. I want to know a little bit more, like, and I don't even mean this in a mean way, like. Like, what made her a... What was you, the logic? You want to understand reasoning? the steps that got her yes. there. Because, again, if she had Gorilla Glue in the house, it meant that she or someone bought the Gorilla Glue... For something. For something. Right. The only thing I can think of is that, you know, maybe she not, didn't buy it. Maybe her husband or her boyfriend or somebody else that she lives mm-hmm. with in the house... Or her girlfriend. Bought the Gorilla gonna, Glue. Or, assumptions. Or the girlfriend <laughs> bought the Gorilla Glue and, I don't know, put it in the vanity? Like, I don't know. Like... That's the only thing that, like, logically I can think of. Because they probably keep the hairspray under the sink in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And they probably put it under there, too. You know, maybe a couple of months ago they had a leak. And the other person used this to fix a leak. So she's like, okay, well, this is my thing. My thing is, even if she had said, like, oh, I didn't realize what it was. Like, I just grabbed it thinking it was the hairspray. Even that I would have been like, okay, shit happens. You know what I mean? Like... But but she didn't even when her when she came out and explained it she didn't even 
kind of back into that, right? R- she was very upfront. Right. Or the fact that, okay, let's say that she had a terrible, terrible misjudgment, right? Right. It was dark. She couldn't really read the can. We're giving her a lot of benefit. Right. Of that. I know. I'm trying. I'm trying to become. I'm trying to be compassionate here because the woman, you know, had to go to like surgery and be. She sedated. was like that for a month, and she was having headaches. So I'm, and... I'm thinking like, okay, he, here's what else. Like I try to break down. Gorilla glue. When you spray it, it doesn't. It, it's, 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 it's not the consistency of hairspray. Tacky and sticky. Right. Right. So let's say that she started to spray the. The, the spray right. as one does, right? right? <laughs> like hairspray, right, right. Thinking it was... was she, did she ever think of before? I put this on my whole head. Like when she first started putting it, maybe, oh, this is not what I think it is. Right. I, I mean, I, I just have so many questions. I, I, I just wonder like, and how much did she put on? She put on a lot. Because, I mean, a little bit goes a long way, apparently. And you know what? And you know what? You know, everybody's laughing at her and whatever. That could have gone a lot more. That could have gone a lot more serious because if it had gone in her eyes, gorilla. No, but also gorilla glue is very toxic. Right, right. Really? Which we will be addressing that later yes, in yes. another topic. Put a pin in that. Um, Put a pin in that. It's very toxic, and you know, she that could have she could have had some type of poisoning or like oh, severe true, right? allergic reaction. See, okay, you, you know, don't know how you're going to react to things. Yeah, that are, I mean, foreign substance. I mean, yeah. do you know how many Chemicals words you can't ex- <laughs> pronounce? Gorilla glue must have. There's a lot of ashamboogi like a thing. You know, do yeah. not gum. <laughs> yes, uh, poly- something adhesive. Polyurethane is probably the only thing we can pronounce. Right, right. So, well, you know, she became an internet thing. Maybe now Head and Shoulders or Pantene or something will pick Listen, her up as a spokesperson. Or you know what, Gorilla Glue should use her. Like they should both kind of laugh I at the situation. I feel that at this point. Only good things can happen. Yeah, I think they should both because she, well, she's suing them. Well, of course, of course. I think they should settle. But part of the settlement is that she's gonna star in commercials for them for like next year's Super Bowl or something. <laughs> you know, she's just like like she could be walking down the street and they're like using it, and she's like, "That'll hold." I don't think so. That'll wait. hold. I don't think so because misuse of a product. So this is actually a very interesting legal term, mm-hmm. uh, legal concept. When you design a product. Mm-hmm. You have to, in your design or in your testing, right. you have to account for misuse. Oh, really? So, for example, chairs. Okay. You have to account that people are going to stand on the chair. That's why many chairs say, do not stand oh. on the chair. There's a label. Oh, that makes... Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you always have to account for misuse. But it's a reasonable... Misuse, right. Misuse. Because a chair... It is reasonable that somebody may stand on a chair to reach a light bulb or something, yeah. Whatever it may be. It's not reasonable if you put a chair, you know, behind a pickup truck with a rope and think nothing's going to happen. And then sue Ikea. Right, right. Right, right. Um, And it falls apart, right? (laughs) Right, right. Um, Sort of like, actually, now that you said Ikea, that's a great um, example. Ikea has been in very, very intense litigation for many years regarding their bookshelves and their drawer. You know, their Oh, yes. That's why yeah. they all say you have to bolt it right, to the Right, because they've the tipped over and killed, you know, toddlers and yeah, kids. Yeah. So that is an anticipated misuse that a child might climb it right. or whatever. So they do have to account for that. I'm going to go ahead and say <laughs> that I think that, you know, that this is probably not an anticipated misuse. I don't know. Maybe Gorilla Glue. Maybe a lot of people have misused Gorilla Glue, but it just never went viral. <laughs> That's true, too. Yeah. That's true, um, too, because some people maybe just, got you know, caught it in time or yeah. lo resolvieron. And, you know. So, bueno, let's talk about the elephant in the room. You know, well, we're talking, of course, about the one, the only Holy Spirit. Um, well, Brittany. she hasn't died. Well, but she's the Holy Spirit, you know, oh, okay. Britney Spears. Britney, what it is right now. <sighs> As I sit here with my Britney tank top. So everybody's talking about Britney Spears. Framing Britney Spears. Framing Britney Spears. You saw it yesterday. I, I saw it a few did. days before. I saw it. I, I'm, I I'm would, fresh. I would really like to bring in, if we will, could have <laughs> Stephanie <laughs> from Mamas and Merlot. We, we reference Stephanie a lot. We do. We <laughs> she's do. like our contributing editor. She's <laughs> like... <laughs> Um, to join us in this conversation, but, um, so Britney Spears has been all over the news this, uh, this, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this past two weeks. Um, in fact, as we record this episode on fake Friday, her dad's, uh, objections were overruled. 
Um, oh, really? They, they went to court today, but I'll get to that in okay. a minute. I was so, at the gym, so I, I so <laughs> so framing Britney Spears. So oh, I have so many thoughts and feelings about that. Okay, so the New York Times did a. It's a series that they have on on Hulu in conjunction with FX. So every week they do a different like mini documentary on essentially some different people on different subjects on different okay. things so they did one on britney spears and it's about a big part of it is about the conservatorship yeah the free britney movement and the media scrutiny that britney spears was subject to right. um since the beginning of her career and um you know it, it, it does focus especially in the latter end of it on the conservatorship. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the conservatorship. So in about 12 years ago, in 2007, 2008, when Britney had, you know, a very, very rough time, she shaved her head, yeah, was um, 2007. all that. Uh, she was in a very, very bad place. Um, the judge, in, her father came into the picture and asked for a conservatorship. So let's talk all about a little bit about what a conservatorship is. Mm -hmm. A conservatorship is a legal mechanism that exists in order to make somebody a conservator of a conservatee, right? So, so basically, <laughs> so basically, they are putting somebody in charge of you. You're now, under someone's care. The conservatorship can be of body or of estate. And they're or not both. and they're not always together. They're not always together. Or both. Okay. So there could be somebody who um is a conservator of your body in the sense of where you could go and what you could do, mm -hmm. or there is of your estate. So those like your finances. What your finances are, they control your finances, okay. or of both. Generally, it is of both because conservatorships historically are used predominantly for elderly people. Like people maybe that have dementia right, right, or right. have like Alzheimer's. And a lot of times it's people that have a lot of money, right? Right, right. That they need somebody. I mean, they didn't get Howard Marshall. Anna Nicole's husband wasn't in one. Hmm. That they need somebody to do that. And generally the conservatorship, you know, because a lot of people have asked me, they've texted me like, well, what's the difference between that and a power of attorney? Well, a power of attorney is something yeah, that you different. give to someone. And somebody that has a power of attorney can make those decisions for you, but you proactively give it to somebody and right. you have to be of sound mind and body. Right, right, right. Whereas a conservatorship, it's the other way around. The conservatee doesn't give the authorization to do that. A court does. So generally a court based does on certain that, findings. Based on certain findings. Generally a court does that when it is um proven by a, uh, a specialist or a medical doctor that you are incapacitated or unable to fend for yourself and make your own decisions. That's why it's usually in, you know, usually it's for elderly people right. or very, very extreme um, right. circumstances. And generally these conservatorships are short. A lot of times in the case of elderly people, they die. Right. So, so the, you know, it just ends, um, right. but they're short. Britney Spears' conservatorship has been going on for over 12 years. Yeah. Right? And a lot of people have been questioning it. Here's what I... I Obviously, none of us know right. what's in there. And as the documentary states, there was an attorney that Britney Spears wanted to hire. And... Um, he, had, he asked her certain he questions. He asked her certain questions. And he thought she was of sound mind. The responses were um, lucid. To be able to... She had the capacity of hiring an attorney. According to um, him. And the court... The judge said that she had Britney's medical evaluation, and based on that, she was not going to allow Britney to pick her own attorney, right. that the court will pick her attorney. Basically, the records said otherwise. So this is my comment about that, and this is a part that I don't understand. And this is a little bit of my psych background, because I also have a psych background. One of the most severe mental illnesses you could have is schizophrenia. Right? Right. That's one of the most severe cases where i mean you could completely lose yeah, yeah, who yeah, you yeah. are yeah there are millions and millions of people that have schizophrenia and mind you there's there's a, there's varying levels there's of a spectrum right, there's right, a right. spectrum in schizophrenia um there are millions of people that have schizophrenia who are not in a conservatorship who run regular normal lives as far um, as we know you know, to, are either on medicine or in treatment, but mm -hmm. they run regular lives. So if these people are not subject to a conservatorship, why is she? 
And as I've discussed to you before, mm-hmm. off, <laughs> in, you know, not on the we podcast. We talk about Britney a lot, you know, people. In the 12 years that she has been on the conservatorship, right, right. she has, um, she did a, a Vegas residency. For like five years. She went on the circus tour. She went on the Femme Fatale tour. She, she did she the released, Piece of Me tour. She afterwards. did the Piece of Me tour. She did like three albums. She was on the X Factor and she fulfilled all her commitments. Right, right, right. And you never heard of Britney Spears canceling concerts and Britney Spears showing That's up true. all crazy, yeah, yeah. you know, she, somewhere. She, yeah, yeah, go out at the She employee. was very professional right, right, and she did right. that. So she is at minimum high functioning. Right. Right. So that is the part that kind of baffles me mm-hmm. that I don't understand how this has gone as long as it has. So here's, here's, and I have a lot of feelings about the documentary. First of all, from the fact that, like, I mean, me sentimiento to see, like, the Britney we all fell in love with. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, so, so young. And even, like, during, you know, your, the, the Britney phase and the, in the, in the zone and, and all that. And I was like, oh, that's the Britney that I, that I fell in love with, you know? <laughs> the one thing that I always, you know, again, to your point, we don't know what's going on. But what I always say, and when these people on, on this documentary, which to New York Times credit, they tried to get like everybody under the sun and or nobody, nobody agreed to show up. Um, you know, so they had to go with these and I'm using the biggest air quotes possible. Um, these hashtag free Britney activists. That's not a real thing. Um, but they were right. But they finished. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's not a real thing. That's not something you're going to put on a resume. Um, that's not like Greenpeace. Okay. My thing with all of these free Britney, you know, free Britney, free Britney, free Britney is that we don't know what's going on. And a lot of the times the argument is like, well, you know, the conversation that so-and-so had, she seems okay. Or when they ask her, she doesn't want to be part of it. And this, that, and the other. And my, and again, you know, you know how much I love Britney. My counter to that is the average person, you know, who has severe mental situations you know mental health problems if you ask them do you want to be on medication they're probably going to tell you no if you know do you want to be in treatment they're going to tell you no so just because she doesn't want it just because she doesn't want to be part of it or in it or whatever does not necessarily mean that she needs to be and i say that in the absence of knowledge of what is her true medical situation which by the way she doesn't owe anybody so in my wait, opinion. But you're saying that just because she doesn't want it doesn't mean she should be off of it? Right. But that's that's the whole point. The whole point is that all the evidence suggests that she shouldn't be on it because this is something that historically is for extreme cases. But, we don't, but again, we don't know her medical history. We don't know her medical history, but we know her work history and we know her commitment history. Maybe she's very lucid when she's on her medication, but maybe she doesn't want to take her medication. Right, but there's people who have all types of mental disorders who are not in conservatorships. That's why I give but the there's example. Also, but there's also that's, not that much at stake. That's why, no, not necessarily. That's why I gave, how many celebrities that we know have bipolar too? How many celebrities that maybe we don't know have schizophrenia i worked with people that had schizophrenia and let me tell you something somebody in a schizophrenia a schizophrenic moment. moment or a moment of mania it's pretty intense and those people are not under a conservatorship so why why should she be subject to something that is there uh, i mean there is nothing there's no circumstantial evidence that shows that she should be on it because again she is she for 12 years that's why everybody kind of scratches their head at this because it's it's the 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 point of the conservatorship was that legal mechanism was not created for somebody like her or somebody in this scenario Mm -hmm. she is somebody she is somebody well no i mean there's there's law there's law and there's no, case no, no, law. No, but I'm talking about her situation. We right, don't, but, but we there, don't really know her situation. But that's there's what I'm law. Saying. But that's why I'm telling you that even if her medic, the, I like I thought the most severe. I'm like, okay, what is one of the most severe mental illnesses somebody can have? Schizophrenia. Even if you are schizophrenic, you are not subject to a conservatorship. Yeah, but the average person is not worth as much as she is, which I found interesting. Now I will say I did find it right, interesting. But, but, hold on, hold on. I will find interesting in the documentary that they there was mention at one point 
of because see th- now this is the part that I find a little fishy, where they were talking about creating like a hybrid a working fi- relationship, a hybrid financial right. That's model. not the way that works. That's out of but that's, out of that. Now we're now we're talking but, something. But that is why she is paying her father oh, yeah, to be the conservatorship. Yeah, she's paying mundo. the attorneys, so it's not the attorneys and the father's best interest financially to let go of that conservatorship. Right. So they're going to hold on to that as much as you can because Jamie Spears is getting paid to look over for over her fortune, right? That's what he's been doing forever. Yeah. So so again, she is even they know that she is high functioning. She's done her her work record speaks for itself. Her right? ability to show up. Right? Her ability to show up and that is something that's very very important. So why you know, why this conservatorship? Because again, even people with the most severe mental illnesses, Mm -hmm. okay, are not subject to that. Right. So I I just think there's some shadiness here. And as far as the Free Britney movement, I have to tell you that I disagree with you there because, okay, yes, I wouldn't put Free Britney movement, you know, protester on my (laughs) resume, but you know what? They were right. They were right. They, I mean, what they started saying at first, they were a little kooky, and you know, you were probably like, "What are these people talking about?" But ultimately, they were right because she has acknowledged them. She has said herself that she wants to be out of the conservatorship, so she actually was. They were actually were kind of right. Eh. I just, as much as I love Britney, like I can't see myself like going to the, the you know, any, I, I just to me because I, I feel like there's so many unknown variables. I don't think there's that many unknown variables. I don't. I don't. Well, but we don't know everything. We don't know everything, but I think there's enough very knowing what I know about conservatorships and knowing what I know about the standard of law. I just don't see how they could keep this for as long as they have in good faith. The problem is that there's a lot of money at stake here, and people get very greedy when there's money. And they want money, 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 money. So again, on the opposite side of her, it's in their best interest to keep this conservatorship as long. As it, it it can. So today, actually, there I just was, wanted to be happy. There was a hearing where um, a few months back, Brittany has said that she was not going to work. Yeah, until continue this was working done. until her father was removed as a conservator. She she wanted a bank. She assigned. wanted a bank. She wanted a bank. Yeah. The judge in the did last a, did a hearing didn't remove Jamie Spears, but, but added. added the bank. So it's almost like. Baby steps. Today, so. there was a hearing where Jamie Spears objected to that. To putting the bank on. To putting the bank on and said that he should still be the one making the, the sole, decision. The sole decision. Yes. And the, sh- the court shot down his Objection. objections. So the court ruled for this hearing alone that um, he needs to make decisions with the bank. So he's not going to be making the sole decisions anymore. Um and her attorney said he went on the record and said that um, that they are going to visit the issue of removing the conservatorship ship altogether at a later date. And to go to what you were saying, the attorney that spoke in this documentary, mm-hmm. right, who is an attorney that is a spe- you know he specializes in, in conservatorships. Yeah. He said it himself. He's like, I spoke to her, I met with her. There was nothing to me that indicated that she needed this or she couldn't. At the very minimum, pick her own attorney and look, because I de- I think there's some there's some shady dealing there. But a bueno. I, I don't understand why Jamie is still so involved because because there's because of nine, Lynn. Th- but, but there's Lynn and Lynn is the. I mean, again, there's probably it's perception because throughout her whole career, I felt like Lynn was always the, right. But her father was the one who interjected and filed the conservatorship, not her mother. But they were divorced by then. Yeah, but her mother beat him. Beat him to it. That. And then the father, mom, the uh, mom has been trying to yeah, apparently to, shoot it down as well. She's been trying to get in there, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and and that's why they say Look, that I forgot they were divorced. That nobody happened. can interview her, nobody can get close to her because he also controls the body. He can he can control the who, press, where, the where she goes or where she doesn't go. Right, like she's a prisoner in her own home. It's a lovely home to be a prisoner in. But yeah, but still. A, but, it's a, yeah. but anyway, let's talk about the other part of the documentary, which this is actually the part that I was like, I told you so. Uh, 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 okay, so <laughs> the other part of the documentary addresses the media scrutiny that Britney Spears was subject to uh, you know, for most of her career. It's funny. And Justin Timberlake. It's funny because, I mean, again, we've lived through her entire career, so we've seen it all happen. But when you see... 
la, el yogur que le hicieron la vida a esa mujer no, with the paparazzi. I didn't need to see this documentary. Let me, to see no, it. no, no, no. But when you see it so like condensed, I remember living through it and feeling like it's too much, it's too much. And you see it condensed in the span of like 10 minutes that they just no la dejaban vivir. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't understand how anybody... I remember... I don't understand how anybody could, could be... I... But todo lo que pasó esa mujer... I've always... The fact that she shaved her head is the least... What is going done. on with Britney Spears now is what we've talked about here on the podcast several times, which is selective outrage. When people say, you know, today we're going to get outraged at this. And the best right. example I R. always Kelly. have about this is R. Kelly. Yeah. R. Kelly always told you who he was. But R. Now. Kelly in 1995 married Aaliyah, who was 15. There was no secret about that. But Everybody now we're knew upset. it. But now we're upset. But, but it was okay. Right. R. Kelly then some years later in the mid-2000s or whenever, uh, when there was a videotape of him on peeing on underage girls... There was no dispute about this. And he went to trial on child pornography uh, yeah. allegations. Uh, people were stepping in the name of love. And he had his biggest hits. And then right. the thing with the girls being caged up in the house or prisoners. Yeah, yeah, surviving people knew R. that Kelly, for years. Yeah. And it wasn't until the documentary came out that people were like, oh, R. Kelly's a monster. And it's like, no shit, Sherlock. R. Kelly's like, told you forever like, who he was. R. Kelly has always shown you who he is. So it's this selective outrage. outrage. Mm -hmm. Okay, the thing with Britney Spears, and it's not that I want to sound myself, you know, sound like I'm the smarter person, or I'm like, I've always felt like that since day one. I remember when she had that interview with Matt Lauer, that she had oh. just had her first kid, and she was pregnant with her second kid. Estaba, you know, she she had gained some weight because of the pregnancy. Her the, face the was makeup swollen. Was, was the bad. makeup was she off. Was, she was all over the place. I remember thinking and saying, like, there's something off. Not even that there's something off. Saying just like. I, as a journalist or a producer, would have, have not let that air. I would have stopped. When, the moment she sat down, I would have told the cameras to turn off. I, I, if, if, the, if, if Matt Lauer would have done that interview, and I'm his producer, and he would have come back to me with that interview, I would have been like, you know what? Out of ethical and moral reasons, I'm not going to air this. Right. Because this is something that's absolutely terrible, what this woman is going through. And now we're putting this on for everybody to talk about. And she looks like she's going through and it. And she looks like it, right? Right. I've always thought that. I've always thought that, that from day one, that con ella la cogieron. And everything that she did was bad. And the truth was that she wasn't any more or less sexy than any other girl. Look, at she, look at she was on magazine covers. During her time or before? Look, at she was on magazine covers. She was on magazine covers no, 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 because she was popular. She was popular. Right, but was she? But even what she wore in Baby One More Time is not any more or less sexy. She didn't create the schoolgirl uniform than any anything else before her. She didn't create the schoolgirl uniform, and everybody everybody ate it up because why? They fed from her the same way that they're eating from her from the conservatorship. You know, the all paparazzi. these paparazzi would make you know, como dijo the guy. Oh, I have a family, and you know, I want to buy a house and all that. So right. you go. The and one, you, the one that they asked, he, he was like, well, you know, that was a, that, the one that he got the umbrella. Yeah. She's like, well, hadn't she told you to stop before? And he's like, well, you know, she had said, like, leave me alone now, but not forever. Right. You know. Really? Uh, she was just talking about that one day. Really? Right. So it, it was just, I've always thought that always from the very, very, very beginning. And I think that the whole thing that they did of her, um, like the whole little girl image and mm -hmm. then sexualized her. I think that that was all artificial. I think, I think that she, you know, when she first started, she was 17, 18, like any, any regular she was girl. Like 15. Well, when she came out with baby one more time, she was in 15. She filmed that video. I think she was 15, 16. No, no, because Britney Spears was born in, I think 1980 or 81. Britney and, is going to be 40 this year. Right. And that video came out 20 years ago. You're so bad with numbers. I am horrible with numbers. She was in 15. No way. A, um, I mean, she was young, but she was in 15. A, but regardless, that whole thing of her being a little girl and then she turned into like a sex pop. That was all manipulated because any regular girl who's growing goes up through that. goes through that. To so varying degrees, yeah. So what's any what's different new? than her? What's new here? So that and my favorite part of it was the you know the reckoning of justin timberlake i've always told you you know how i feel about that individual well you know how i feel about that individual we talked about that in our very first episode you know how because I feel about in that our individual. first episode we talked about the super bowl Beda. which would have been three years ago which he did and we were talking about, about him being the janet half, jackson right and, yeah. the whole janet jackson thing yeah. he so 
I like Justin Timberlake's music. That, let's make no mistake about he's it. He's talented. He's super he's talented. Performer. He could put on a great, great show. I actually think he's kind of cool, you know. But I've never, I've always thought that he he's appropriated and he's always been, he's always taken advantage of situations. Now. To his benefit. To his benefit. Now, with the whole Britney thing, I, I've always thought that we too. We lived it. I've always thought that too. I'm like, he lived, he stole that narrative. Yeah. He made it his own. Whether it was true or not, he made it his own. And he now she was a villain. about them having sex, and now she was a villain. Y como dice the documentary, notice how everybody asked Brittany, what did you do to poor Justin? Right. right. What did you do to Justin? He did cry me a river, and then he painted her there as a slut. Right? Right. Right? And as a cheater and all this right. stuff. And that's the narrative that he stole. And right. he played her dirty. Very. He played her really dirty. And let's not even talk about what he did. No, let's talk about let's what he did to about, Janet Jackson. Let's keep going down you know, the road, shall we? You know, what he did to Janet Jackson, right? Because okay, she had to come out and give a freaking, you know, statement about her tit. And I, he's like, oh, I didn't know. I actually, I tweeted about it this week. Yes, I know. You saw my Twitter? Yes, you've just discovered I, Twitter, yes. Yes. I, <laughs> I, I, I have just discovered He's a little Twitter. late to the game, ladies and gentlemen, but he's making up for lost time. Well, you know, not everybody's on Twitter. What did I tweet? I tweeted. That's true. Not everybody is on Twitter, but you know. I tweeted. For years, I've been saying how unfair the media and public were to Britney Spears and how Justin Timberlake used their breakup for his benefit. Too bad it took 18 years of conservatorship and a documentary for people finally to see how cruel she has been treated. Right. El, El, when he did the whole Janet Jackson thing, mm -hmm. right, she said it. She's like, we were friends and he left me out to dry. Mm -hmm. Because he did. Right. And then it was like four years later that he gave a statement in which he said, yeah, they were really cruel to her and they were really mean to her and she took like 90% of the Right, blame. but you didn't man up in of the moment. Of course, of course. Because now, you were looking out for yourself now, like a little bitch. The only benefit of the doubt that I give him, the only, mm -hmm. is that both the Britney Spears incident and the Janet Jackson incident happened at the launch of... At the launch, the Britney Spears one happened at the launch of his solo career, and the Janet Jackson one happened when his solo career had already like was the, was like the the zenith. Yes, yeah. right. So I'm sure there was a lot of record company, you know, kind of management. You know what? Yes, but you know, but, but at that, that point he's still Justin Timberlake, especially with Janet Jackson, because he with Britney. Whatever you want to play the victim, play the victim. The God knows there are many people out there who play the victim. It's like a per, per fucking profession nowadays. But with Janet, he had enough star power. He didn't to be able to go to his right. company and be like, "No, I understand. No, right. it's not right." And I always say the thing about Janet Jackson, and I, I say this over and over again. Well, we said it here on the podcast. Go to episode one yeah. and, and listen to it. If you ever want an example of sexism, modern day sexism is that. Because she was labeled a slut after the Super Bowl incident. Mm -hmm. She was blacklisted from MTV. She was not invited to the Grammys. She got blacklisted from up. everything. Her career tanked. And she, you know, you're talking about Janet Jackson. Yeah, it's not somebody who who's starting out. An icon. Her career tanked. And you can make the argument that it never recovered. Right? I would. Whereas I would. his, you know, a week later or two weeks later, yeah, he Grammys. was in the Grammys. Performing then, oh, at the Grammys. And the Super Bowl said, come on back. Right. Performing at the Grammys. The Super Bowl, he came back to the Super Bowl. His career took off. He became an actor. And he was a stud. He, yeah. You know? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times people are like, oh, no, you know, because uh, there's not sexism anymore. And, you know, women complain too much. And, you know, women have more rights. In no. We know that that's not true. But that is an example right. of how the rules are not the same when you're a girl. Right. Because how can you explain... Don't even talk about the fact that she's a black woman. How Exactly. <laughs> how can you explain that the difference in effect between her and him? Yeah. Because you know what? The whole thing with a wardrobe malfunction, I actually think that they did it on purpose. Of course they did. Right? Because they, you know, they said that, oh, he was supposed to rip off the leather part, but the lace part was supposed to stay... But regardless, regardless of whether they were both in on it. They were they knew what was going to happen right. because the song literally ends on the words have you naked by the end of the song. So whether they intended her boob to show or not, to me that doesn't matter, right? Something what, was going to happen. Something was going to happen. What matters was the fallout. The subsequent the fallout. Right. Right? And I think, you know, back to Britney Spears that he 
he just was a little bitch about it. Yeah. A little bitch. You know, yeah. to his benefit. Yeah. And, you know, I don't... Look, I don't... I don't wish for people to cancel Justin Timberlake because, again, he's very talented and, you know, he's a great performer. Right. And, you know, I think that as a singer and an artist, he has something to contribute. But call and him I, out on his and shit. And I, I don't think that he's a bad person. But, yeah, call him out on his shit and he needs to man up and, and say what he needs to say. And you be know? like, you know what? Yeah. I say did what some he shitty things. Because he, you know, he was young. He was stupid. Whatever. Narrative you want to give. Girl, right? You know, you want to give. Because he freaking fucked over. Two very two of the biggest pop female pop icons, and he did. I don't think he did it on purpose, mm. but you know the road to hell was paved with good intentions. You know, I don't think he did it by accident. So if you haven't seen it by now, everybody watch Framing Britney Spears. Yes, on Hulu. On Hulu. So, and for those of you listeners who are probably saying, "Oh, we've gone all this time without any politics." <laughs> yes, we are watching the impeachment. Um, Yes, we have seen the terrible videos and all that. Um, you know, shout out to the officer. You was his name Eugene, Eugene Goodley, I think is his name. I believe so, Eugene something. Um, I just, I haven't been watching as much as I should be. No, 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 no. You are watching the exact right amount because at the eso te pone mal. I mean, and you need body. and you need to detox a little bit. I, I do, I do, because okay. um, I take these things way too seriously. You know, it's only the future and foundation of our country and no, our no, democracy. No, 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 and I get it, but you need to take but, a breather once but in a while. To okay? me, like one of the reasons I have not been so invested in it is because I know they're not going to do the right thing. Nothing's going to come of this. I know that the Republicans are not going to impeach him. Maybe some will. But the majority of the party is not. And Marco Rubio is a pansy person. <laughs> um, and Rick Scott is another... Oh, don't even start me on Rick Scott. He looks like a Bond villain. Uh, he does. I've always said it. All he needs is a white cat. Yes. And a beige suit. Yep. I've always said it. He looks like a Bond villain. Um, they're not going to do the right thing. And they're putting... It's not even party over politics because that's not the Republican Party. I'm not sure what that is. Um, if I, and I, I say this all the time. Might as well be called the Justin Timberlake Party. <laughs> you know, they're looking out for themselves. If if I was a real Republican, you know, like the Megan McCain, um, right. I would. Well, she is so pissed off. Uh, yeah. So I'm not watching it, or I'm not putting as much effort into it because I know he's going to be acquitted. They're not going to impeach him. They're going to come up with all this bullshit. Like, oh, we need to unify the country. And Do you think that there will be a, a there could potentially be grounds for a criminal um, trial or a criminal hearing or no, because that's not in the place of the criminal. Uh, I don't think, any, no, but for for inciting a riot, I don't think say. any. That's what this is for. Right, I don't but, think. I don't think any criminal court has jurisdiction on the president of the United States. Hmm. That's why. Couldn't they charge? Him, this is me. Like this is me going with my you know law and order degree. Could they? Because obviously they're gonna. The, the other people, you know, the 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 insurrectionists will be charged with something or other. Mm -hmm. Could they kind of charge him as a like a. No. Agitator or co conspirator no. or no. Impeachment is the proper jurisdictional avenue to charge a president with uh, high crimes and misdemeanors. Okay. What's interesting is from what I've heard, a lot of the people that are going to be tried that have been arrested for mm -hmm. the insurrection, part of their defense is going to be that they were following his orders. So it's just interesting that the... So they're going to blame him yes. as part of the defense. Right. But so it's just interesting that his defense... Is that he didn't do anything. Is that he didn't cause it. But their defense, the insurrectionists, when they get to their trial, right. is going to be that he ordered them. He told them to do it. He told them to do it. They're following his orders. Which leads you further to say, why would I follow... 
any president's order to do something like that. Like, well, I would have followed anybody's order. Anybody's period. order, right? You know, like, go storm this. I'm, you know, you're the fucking president. You're not going to tell me to go storm something. Like, mm, fuck you. Fuck like, you. Like, yeah. like, so, you know, to our Pero Politica fans. Yes. Because <laughs> uh, we've gotten a lot of comments from people that really enjoy our po- po- political talk. Yes. Um, Pala talk. Uh, Pero Politica. Um, I, again. I think I, we should really explore doing maybe like a monthly bonus political episode i don't mind but i i, I would like to do it with somebody that's, no, no, who, but that's what i'm saying I, we should explore so we can find i would like right. to do it with somebody you know if you're a listener you're a conservative and a, and a republican a real see, conservative see, when we say, when we say republican, republican we're talking like like a megan mccain republican you know, uh, an Navarro republican you know, uh, donald like, trump and not donald, um, ronald reagan <laughs> form of republicanism. right 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 if you a are romney um, if you are a real republican a real conservative and you want to be part of a podcast let DM us. Yeah. We would love to have you. All right, listeners. So this week we've got an interview with you for you with someone who's, I mean, she does it all. You know, she is a poet, an author, an actress, an artist. She's an entrepreneur. I mean, honestly, like, I, I'm running out of fingers counting how many things she does in one hand. So it's Meet the Michelle. She's a Dominican-born uh, lady, and she lived in Miami for a little bit, so we kind of touch on that uh, for a couple seconds here and there. But she's in L.A. now, and she had the graciousness to give us an interview and chat about you know her work and what inspires her. And so, without further ado, meet the Michelle. All right, welcome back, mi gente. So, as mentioned, with us today we have best-selling author. She's also an actress, uh, Mirta Michelle. She's here to talk about really her career as a creative overall. Because I mean, the more you you you, you hear about her, you know, from her latest book, Eighteen Inches: Distance Between the Heart and Mind, to her acting, to the creative initiatives. I mean, girl, you got a lot going on. Like, I mean, you are a busy lady. I, I try to stay busy. That's my way of staying sane. <laughs> well, thank you so much for also, taking a also moment. I, I, also, I have expensive taste. <laughs> well, no, no, that, helps. <laughs> that helps. I can relate. I can relate. It ain't going to pay itself, right? <laughs> it won't. <laughs> Oh, so thank you so much for joining us. I oh, hope you're doing really well. I know you're out on the West Coast enjoying the fantastic weather out there as opposed to the raininess we're having here in Miami. I'm, that always passes in Miami. I'm originally from Miami. That's right. And you just you just got used to the rain um, in Miami. But I'm a born and raised Miami boy, and después de 40 años, I'm still not used to the rain. So I don't know. I don't know how long it's going to take. I will tell you something. People drive a lot better in Miami in the rain than they do here in L.A. because it hardly ever rains in oh. Southern California. So people have no idea how to drive. I think people stay home when it rains more often. If they don't have to be out, they will not go out. It, it's, it's ridiculous. It, it, people just just become full of fear when it rains here. <laughs> but imagine that if they were to do that here in Miami, we'd never grow out with the amount of times that it rains. <laughs> So you know, I know you. You know, you're, you're a Dominican Dominican girl, born, uh, raised in Miami. Um, yes. How did you get started? Because I I know you know, 18 inches is your latest release, but it's not your your first release. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you're a best selling author, so I believe you've got two other uh, books uh, under your belt. I have uh, I have three other books, three. but two two other books under part of this 18 inches series. This 18 and 18 inches is the last installment of the letters series that I began with my first book titled Letters to the Men I Have Loved. And that's really the book that started my journey. I always knew that I wanted to publish a book since I was like seven years old. Oh, wow. And yeah, I always had that, that goal pretty clear since I was a child. And I finally did it, and uh, I did it more as a, as an art project hmm. because, yeah, I, I just I, I didn't know it was going to become the success it became. Right. Um, I I did it more, you know, just to release, to express myself, kind of like like when when a painter paints, they're not painting because they want to sell a painting. They're painting because. That's what uh, yeah. they, they gotta they, get it out. They, 
you, you, they need to get it out. Yeah. So it, it's a need. It's a necessity. So for me, that is what writing is. And I um, and I wrote that first book. It, it was it's such a raw book. I didn't edit it much. I just released it, and and it became a huge success. And that that continued my journey as as a poet and as an author. And um, and now here we are, fourth book, eighteen pages, which I'm super proud about. I think it's my best work. It's my best work in in every sense, in my opinion. Really, um, in, in what I mean, you said in every sense, but I think in what way? If you had to pick one way, what would you say? Just because it's it's more of a reflection of who you've become, and so who you more truly are, or? Well, I I, I believe that uh, my first book and the second one, and the third, I think they're all those books are are for a moment in time of my life, hmm. and and I think they're so special, just you know, in the same equal way. They're all my babies. But I feel that with this book, you can see the growth as a writer for me. Okay. You know, we continuously um, try to excel in what we do to get better. It's like that Mamba mentality, right? You want to get better. And I think that, that this book has, has demonstrated that I have grown as a writer. And, and also in my vulnerability, my confidence as as a poet, because I believe that vulnerability takes courage, and when you're expressing and sharing such deep points in your of your life, it takes courage. And I think that I I, I mean I went all the way out there. Like I, I had a lot of courage. I I expressed things that I hadn't shared with anyone really, and I definitely. That and I definitely have done that because I, I, um, I, I understand the importance of the artist in society, of expressing uh, with words or with art, whatever it is you're feeling. Because in the end, there's other people that don't have the words to describe what you're going through. So I feel like it's very tough. Yeah, you're like a you're you're like a conduit for other people's emotions because a, a lot of times you know we're, we're all feeling things but we don't necessarily know how to put it into words and I think that's where where you know artists like yourself are are so I'm just gonna say they're very necessary in the world right because so many times I think we go through life like I know what I'm feeling but I don't know how to articulate it and am I the only one and and if I can't say it out loud then is it even real and you know that type of thing and and you know artists and writers such as yourself who put it into the world in word I think you you fulfill a very big you know need uh that that we don't always realize is necessary in the world you know, I, that's what I feel is my purpose, and I feel that that people they grow, they evolve their lives. I, I my goal is always for when people to read my books for them to to feel inspired to become the best version of themselves, and to not so not to be so hard on themselves. I feel that a lot of times we tend to to bring ourselves down uh, instead of. Instead of finding that that positivity in in the negative, right, or finding the gold and but you know finding the diamond yeah. in the, the silver lining amongst the, to, to be to be cliche, line, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not cliche, it's the truth. <laughs> yeah. The truth. Yeah, yeah. And you you know you you mentioned obviously you know as a writer it's it's what's inside of you and it's it's authentic and it's about being your true self and and really expressing that one of the things that i that i wanted to ask you about is you know your collections are essays and poems and you know uh letters like as you mentioned but i also know that you do it bilingually so you know obviously being dominican uh you know latina being bilingual is a very true essence to who you are. Um, you know, I would I would assume just I'm basing it on myself as well. You know, being Cuban American, born and raised in Miami. You know, it's just it is how it is. How do you find that 
it is writing that out bilingually, quote unquote, I'm going to say with Spanglish, in a way that seems authentic. And I, the reason I'm asking this question is because many times when I've seen, you know, bilingual writing, Spanglish writing, so on, whatever, you know, a hybrid of that done, I can always tell when it's not done by someone who understands how that works as with regard to the rhythms of the of the words. And how do you overcome that? Because you know, you're you're not just writing a sentence, you're writing a whole piece. Yeah, I well, so not all my books are bilingual. So only my second book, mm-hmm. and I actually did it as an homage to our culture. I fell in love with poetry at a young age, but I found my my poetry style, right, of writing through reading um, Spanish poets. Really? Yes, through reading, uh, like, Gustavo Adolfo Becker, and also my favorite poet, is Ch- uh, he was Chilean, Pablo Neruda. Oh, yeah. And so uh, poetry in Spanish really influenced my work since I was a child. So for me, what sometimes when I think of of certain especially romantic poetry, mm-hmm. when I think when I think of certain words, I think of them in Spanish. And it's interesting because I was raised in Miami. Obviously Miami is like not part of the US I feel. <laughs> uh, but I, I didn't have the um, uh, an education in Spanish. I studied in English, so I my vocabulary wasn't as extensive in Spanish than, you know, if you compare it to my English. No estaba desarrollado, as they say. Y no había desarrollado así. Pero, I'm like, pero. But I genuinely um, loved it so much that I took my time to read a lot in Spanish. Mm. So I, for me... Uh, to me, poetry in Spanish is the most beautiful. The Spanish language, like correct Spanish, <laughs> it is stunning. <laughs> stunning, stunning, stunning. So for me, it's always been a source of inspiration. So when I um, decided to write this second book, I decided to do it uh, bilingual because I had written also a lot of poetry in Spanish already. And that's me, I, when I was translating it into English, I was like, oh, wow, but in Spanish, it's just so much more beautiful. Right. So, I, yes. So, I decided to, um, I decided to, to, to publish this, this, this collection, uh, and to, to me, like, it's the most romantic collection I have. It's just so beautiful. Um, but yes, I, I, if there's a reason that I haven't translated my work to other languages, it's because I'm a bit, I get, I get a bit scared yeah. of like, who's going to translate it? I, I don't know if it's going to sound like how I make my work sound. It would lose some so, of the meaning too, you know, ultimately, because you, you, when you pick a certain word, there's a reason, there's a purpose, you know, it's, it's not just translated in Google. So I, I totally understand that fear. It's, it, I'll give you a perfect example. Like the Bible. There's like a hundred different translations. You know, it's like, and they all, they all choose different words. And it's the Bible. We're all pretty familiar with the Bible. <laughs> and that's the Bible. So, so imagine poetry, right? <laughs> that's a great example. That is a great example. But no, I, I totally... I. I relate to everything you've just said because, you know, growing up bilingual, there are just instances where there are certain words, you know, the the beauty of Spanish is that certain words just have a more romantic sound. And I don't even mean, you know, romantic in in the traditional way, right? I mean, you know, just, they just sound more, more beautiful and more compelling. And, and also they just have more meaning to you, you know, in a more, in the most simplistic way. I always tell people it's like, to me, the word grandmother, I mean, if I have to say it, to use it as a descriptor for mine, yeah, that makes sense. But it doesn't mean anything to me, whereas abuela does. 
you know, it's it, it's 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 that emotion. And then there's the whole thing where like. I totally don't like the word mortgage, but I love the word hipoteca in Spanish, but that's just me being weird. Um, the beautiful language. No, but I'll, I'll, I'll make it even more more specific. Have you ever heard of anyone call a man an English lover? <laughs> it's, you always hear Spanish lover. This is true. Latin lover. Latin lover. That's right. That's right. Well, I think we've earned that title, though. I think there's a reason. I think <laughs> the the, um, the Latin languages, English. I mean, Spanish, yeah. French, Italian are just a, you know, are more romantic All in general. Languages are great. Romance languages. So for me, I mean, that's, I'm not being biased because <laughs> I'm Latina. It's okay. It's just like, like just me being being um, a fan, right? <laughs> Listen, it's okay to be a little biased, especially when you're telling the truth. That's okay. Spanish is a beautiful language. <laughs> it's not bias; it's fact. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, but definitely, my culture has has had a huge influence in everything I do. Oh, that's awesome. everything I do. That's awesome. So, you know, that brings us to, to you know, 18 inches, uh, like I mentioned, distance between the heart and mind. It was released this year. And I, I actually just want to ask, you know, a question, because I, how far ahead was all of the writing completed? And was any of it kind of affected by this year? Because I know this year has just been, let's go ahead and use the word interesting for a lot of people. And, you know, you mentioned a lot about growth. And I'm just wondering if, if it managed to make its way into any of these writings or if it's... No, no, no. This book was actually finished because how publishing works, like mm -hmm. traditional publishing, right. is that you finish the book and then the publisher will take it, read it, make sure that, that they're okay with publishing it, mm -hmm. then, then you have a lot of like business dealings mm -hmm. you have to uh, work out and, and then you have proofreading and editing and then you have to get a cover and it takes at least a year oh, wow. okay. to put a book together. Um, so to be honest, this book was all I had already finished writing it in, um, in early 2019. Oh, wow. Okay. Early 2019. I think I was able to squeeze in a poem or two. <laughs> summer of 2019, but I didn't touch it after the summer summer of 2019. Oh. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was pre-pandemic. The writing was pre-pandemic, but it, it was affected by the pandemic because it, the original release date of 18 Inches was supposed to be May 5th. Mm. And because of the pandemic, my publisher decided to push it uh, to September thinking that it was going to be all over and I could go on <laughs> my book tour and, yeah. Oh, uh, little did we know. We all know how that happened, <laughs> how that happened. <laughs> little did that we know. Bad. Little did we know. Little did we know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but let me tell you something. I, 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 don't, I don't have any regrets. I think things happen how they're supposed to happen. Absolutely. It made me work a little harder. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we, we definitely need people like yourself who are, you know, creating true and authentic writing that speaks not just for yourself, but, you know, really for so many other people as well. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's my purpose. That's the best way to put it, quite honestly. I mean, the, 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 I, you, in a nutshell. Yeah, and, and I, it's, it's an amazing avenue that I have to connect with people. I, I love people. I, 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 I'm one of those people I genuinely love others. I want others to, to be the best version of themselves and to find their own purpose and, and, and to feel fulfilled and content. I feel that happiness goes up and down, right? Yep. We'll all have bad days or days that we feel down. But the overall idea of being on Earth is not only enjoying what the beauty of Earth, because it's a beautiful planet, but also it is to always push forward and to evolve our souls to 
uh, a higher to a higher self. So I I believe that I am able to express that with my work and by me sharing my my life and the things that I've learned, I feel that I am able to connect with people in, a, in an authentic way that they can ask themselves those same questions and it could inspire their own journey. So uh, for me, writing is the key to that. For me, well, for some people, their music, you know, for me. So every page is a song, if that makes sense. Yes, it is. It makes total sense to me. And, you know, I will say this. You, you are very inspirational. And, you know, I want to thank you again for, for taking the time to chat with us today. Um, you know, obviously, listeners, if you have any more inquiries about all the other things that, that Meep does up to, because it's a lot of stuff, you can visit her website. That's an amazing candle. They looked really cute. Cool. Yeah, that, that was our first collection. We did. I'm, I'm obsessed with Greek mythology, with mythology in general, oh, and mythology. We, did, yeah, we did this this collection called the Mythology Collection. Three candles, three cents, and all the candles have quotes from my my different books. Hmm. So, quotes, you know, inspirational quotes that that you have anywhere by your bedside at your office. Uh, in your bathroom, where, in your living room, yeah, where, <laughs> wherever it will, it will remind you of something positive, right? And then the scent, I I worked on unique scents, mm -hmm. and they smell great. Um, so we're always going to be, you know, releasing new new scents, new quotes, and they're they're amazing. They're great gifts. Great yeah, gift. they look at okay, listen, ho holidays are around the corner, guys. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, meet that bueno. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Guys, you know, you can go to her website, uh, meetthatmichelle.com. Uh, also, I'll be tagging her. Uh, con H, con H, con H. Con H, that's right, that's right. It's Mirta, like, and I'll say this because it's a, it's our audience, like Mirta de Perales, the shampoo, it's, you know, with the H. Yes, yes. <laughs> Oh my God! I, that, I used to love those commercials when I was little. I used to always pretend chica mirta. Well, I will say a little they trivia. Actually, they actually follow me on Instagram. It's so funny. They follow us too. Actually, a little trivia for you. My co-host who couldn't make it uh, today to, to the interview, he actually growing up as a little kid was a chico mirta. So he actually. Oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Wow, it's such a Miami Cuban thing, by the way. Really? I, I'm I'm not I'm Dominican, but I grew up with Cuban, so I feel that I'm. Oh, I mean, I have a little Cuban in me. My great grandfather was Cuban, but I I it's my it's like it's like home to me, you know. So well, uh, I I whenever people talk about Cuban anything, I I connect. Oh, listen, <laughs> in Caribe, we're all <laughs> similar, you know. Yes. Yeah. We're all primos. Of course, of course. <laughs> bueno, and on that note, prima, thank you so much for joining us. And we're back. I'm telling you, I always think of Wake Up San Francisco whenever you, you do that. And we're back? Yeah, I don't know why. Like, oh. I genuinely don't know why. Well, you know. <laughs> Wake up. Hi. So that was fun. That was. I mean, it was It was great because she actually did the whole interview like at, in her car as she was driving. As one does. You know, it's like, man, we don't, we have a lot of guests who, you know, who interview us like on the go in their car. Well, because, you know, now, it's great. In, now in the day of um, the virtual, COVID, yeah. you know, it, I mean, where do you do an interview? Yeah. The Zoom call is, it is our livelihood. It's funny because like prior to COVID, we obviously, you know, sometimes we had interviews with people on Skype or whatever. If they were in another state. Yeah, right. right. But generally, we like to have all our interviews in person. And now it's like, even when we interview somebody who's down the street, it's like, oh. Can we do it virtually? You know, so, <laughs> and, and, you know, we try to make it be the same. I Obviously, I personally prefer the real person yeah, here. Yeah. But um, There's something to, to having feeding off that energy in person. Yeah. Um, bueno. Let's get to our last sodas. Okay. You you look like you've you look like you have one ready to go and you're very I proud do. of it. So my last soda is to I mean there's 
no secret that I fangirl over him <laughs> is to the weekend. That's right. We didn't talk about the weekend. We're gonna talk about the now weekend now. When I mean the weekend, weekend I mean Abel. <laughs> you know, yes, yes, the not singer, the long weekend. That's the happening weekend. now. Yeah. We talked about the weekend about the beginning. Yes. The real weekend. Um so That's the most confusing sentence. <laughs> we talked about the weekend the beginning, the real weekend, not the other weekend, the one who's a singer. Um so last week was the Super Bowl. That's right. And I I'm not a huge football fan. But I generally do like to watch the game. Right, especially if it's a good game. I had no interest in watching this game whatsoever. It was not a good game. Mm-hmm. No Inter- interest. I mean, yes, Tom Brady Brady is the greatest of all time, blah, 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 blah. Look, I'm not going to hate on Tom Brady because my favorite team is the Yankees. And a lot of the argument that people have about Tom Brady is the same argument true. they have about the Yankees. Oh, you know, they always win. They're right. the empire, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, but you know what? Good for him. He won seven rings. You know, Rita. He has more rings than fingers. Okay, great. Right. Orita, he's the Thanos of Super Bowls. And I, I was just like, I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, because I generally do like to watch the game. Yeah. Um, but this particular time, no. But I was looking forward to the halftime show. Yes. A lot of people had criticisms on the halftime show that they thought that it was a little boring. It was, I wouldn't say boring, I would say subdued. And here's the thing. In defense of Abel, okay, first of all, he was challenged in the sense that he couldn't have the stage in the middle. Right? Okay, right. So he had the stage on the side, which was cool in a way. It was interesting. It was interesting and I, it was different. But obviously, when you have a stage in the middle in a stadium filled with 70 plus thousand people, right. you know, you could be there with a harmonica that you're, everybody's <laughs> going to be excited. Right? Do not give the Super Bowl any ideas. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so, you know, he had a lot working against, against him. him. Right. Also, he was coming off the heels of... Jennifer Lopez and Shakira, yeah. who, as we say, were the closing ceremonies to the world as we knew it. Yes, that was the closing ceremony of 2020. Which is probably one of now one of the most famous Super Bowls of all time. Yeah, so Super Bowl halftime performances, and there was a lot going on. There was a lot going on. There was a lot of energy, you know, because that's who they are. Right. Whereas he is a different genre of music, right. right? So I think all things considered, I think his show was great. Do I rank it as one of the best Super Bowl shows of all time? No. But I think it was fun. It was enjoyable. It was enjoyable. I mean, he did the best that he could. It was different. Right. Um, I, I'm always going to side with him because I love him. But yeah, I but thought you it was also, good. But you, you also are very fair. Like, even, you know, artists that you love, mm-hmm. you call them out when they give a bad performance or when yeah. they do something that's lackluster. Yeah. So... I, I, I tend to side with you when you're enthusiastic about an artist because I know you'll also take the... I thought his set list was great. That was you know, really good. Yeah. He, he did some of his greatest hits. And you know what? I think the Super Bowl is not the time for you to start pulling out B-sides. No. And, you know, no, and no, no, album no, 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 no. This is the new song I'm working on. Right. Like, no, yeah. this is no. the new song. No, I don't want to no. hear your new song. No. Give us the hits, babe. Let's <laughs> yeah. go. Yeah. You, you yeah. need to put your biggest hits on yeah. that. Period. You got right? five minutes. Right. Dale. So... Um, I thought it was good. You know, he got some shit. Some people liked it. Some people didn't. Um, He got some shit. Uh, I also give him credit because the thing with The weekend, as you probably know, The weekend, a lot of his subject matter is really dark. Dark, yeah. You know? Yeah. It may sound bubbly, but but it's not. not. (laughs) And, you know, his... his, From his image to his videos, they're they're very not prime time, right? Right. Especially not Super Bowl. That's why when he was given the Super Bowl, I was like, as much as I like him, I would have not thought that he right. was Super Bowl not that he's not Super Bowl material because clearly he can be that it's something they would have courted right because especially with this album like he yeah. has a very dark image yeah. with this out with the whole like storyline of this mm-hmm. current album um but you know he kept it he, he, he kept it very tasteful Right, right. He kept it very tasteful. He even I saw the press conference he even said that you know he knows how families watch this right. and um and it was fine. I also kind of appreciated that he didn't make it political. <laughs> it was refreshing. It was refreshing. It was refreshing. Because I'm always down for a political moment. You but know, sometimes... But, he, but he's Canadian. You know how those Canadians... They, they're they're <laughs> very sometimes polite. you just need a break. So I was kind of happy with that too. So, you know, my last soda, although it was the Pepsi halftime. That's true. <laughs> my last soda goes to Abel, to the weekend. To the weekend. Well, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean... It was entertaining. I don't think it was necessarily memorable in the in the in you know. Yeah, the, I mean, I wouldn't put him, as, of, as much Super as Bowl I like him. I wouldn't put him in the top ten, you know, Super Bowl performances right, of all right. time. But it was good enough. Yeah, it, it did the job. It was number room five. It. 
You know what my biggest problem with Maroon 5 was? What? My problem with Maroon 5, and I don't dislike Maroon 5. I know you don't. And I don't dislike Adam Levine at all. I think Maroon 5 has... Maroon 5 is popular enough to have a be a halftime act. Right. My problem was the collaborations. They were so not... They were so like, we're in Atlanta, we need to have a rapper. Right, right. Right, so bring whatever rapper, you know? Right, right. It was so like... It didn't seem fun Contrived. Out. Like, it wasn't... It was just such a turnoff because it's like... Again, they were probably like, oh yeah, we're in Atlanta. Right, right, right. Then if that's the case and you should have given it... To an Atlanta artist. To an Atlanta artist. I think they should have given it to Jerping Dupree and bring on his roster of people. But that's a, <laughs> that's a story for another day. <laughs> I mean, hello. Jermaine Dupree has a song called Welcome to Atlanta, which the remix is like freaking awesome. But whatever. That's another story. <laughs> uh, well, my last soda. In a Ferrari, Jaguar, switching four lanes, top down, screaming out, money ain't a thing. Go ahead. <laughs> My last soda could not be as far removed from what you just did if it tried. Um, so my last soda actually goes to the family of the late Alex Trebek. Oh, and the sh- and that the, one that one hit hard. And the producers of Jeopardy. Yeah. Um. So they have taken fourteen of his two Canadians the weekend of his family. His family. Um, they've taken 14 of his suits, 58 dress shirts, 300 neckties, and various other items of clothing that actually once belonged to Alex Trebek. And they donated it to the DOE Fund, D-O-E Fund, which is an organization that provides paid work, housing, vocational training, continuing education, and comprehensive social services to underserved Americans with histories of addiction, homelessness, and incarceration so that they could have like you know a nice clothing to wear to interviews and things like that so i thought that was very nice you know because think about how i mean again every time this man how many episodes of jeopardy did he do he was always in a suit you know what i mean it it was always you know finely tailored and all that and to just have it sitting in a warehouse somewhere in storage i mean i'm sure some of them went to the smithsonian and you know whatever the canadian equivalent of the smithsonian is But they actually put it to use, you know, and I thought that was just a very nice gesture to show, like, even after he's gone, you know, this is a guy who's still doing classy things. Yeah, that one hurt. I have to say that that one hurt more than I thought it was. Not that I didn't think it was because I love Jeopardy and we all grew up on Alex Trebek, but that one really hurt. Like, I can't believe it. I felt it. Because he was such a staple. Yeah. Yeah. And he was so positive. Yeah, he like, was. Like, he never, right up until the end. He never like, took himself too seriously. He worked until the end. Like, yeah. I think those are, those are, those are real moments that define somebody's character. Yeah. You know? And like we said, he was a game show host, which I don't think exists anymore. Well, tell that to Pat. Zajac. Outside of, I was going to say, outside of Pat and Vanna, <laughs> but like, you don't have a quote unquote game show host anymore. Now you have actors who host game shows. Right. Right. Um, so I think that we should take this episode to um, make our petition, if you want to call it, that next year's halftime guest sh- uh, show should be Dolly Parton. It should be. Listen, Dolly Parton will unify this country. Everybody loves <laughs> Dolly Parton. You don't the have to convince me. The, the liberals, liberals, the Hispanics, the gays, the blacks, the Jewish, the everybody. Asians, everybody. Everybody, everybody. everybody loves Dolly Parton, everyone. I feel like the most somebody could say is that they just don't care for her. But I don't feel like anybody dislikes no, her. No, no. You know what I mean? Like, to actively dislike Dolly Parton, I feel takes more effort. Yeah. <laughs> everybody <laughs> loves Dolly Parton. As they should. As they should. She's a national as treasure. They should. She's a national treasure. And I really, I really think that she will unify this country. It would probably be the highest rated Super Bowl halftime ever. I I don't she's know. She's country. She's pop. She, Mira, she could bring in Miley for a younger demo. Yes. You're right. We need to make this happen. <laughs> she could bring in Deborah Cox to sing I Will Always Love You Together. Oh. <laughs> Who did you think I was talking about? I had a brain fart. You forgot. <laughs> I had a brain fart for a minute. I'm like, why didn't she? <laughs> Which actually, on the day we're recording, this is the anniversary of Winnie's death. It's been oh, nine years. Whoa, whoa, wow, wow, wow. I need, I need water. 
<laughs> There's a reason Whitney wouldn't like, show I, up. In my mind, I was like, wait, why would she? Bring like, why not just bring out Whitney? <laughs> <laughs> wow, 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 wow. I've had a lot of things to do today. I had three Zoom calls. Oh, like, that's, listen, um, the fact that you managed to not become a cat. <laughs> that's true. But yeah, Dolly Parton, you heard it here first, ladies yes. and gentlemen. Dolly Parton 2022. Let's make yeah. it happen, kids. Every, Everybody loves her. Everybody loves her. There's no downside. Yeah. Actually, you know what? That should be a criteria on to, as to whether you like someone or not. Oh, you you hate Dolly Parton or you don't mm, like her? No. You're probably not a good person. You're, that says something about you. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but I know there's something off. Yeah. I mean, for when we went to her concert, so Ish and I went to her concert maybe two or three years ago. No. I, I can't say that I know Dolly Parton's extensive dis- discography. Right. I mean, I know obviously Jolene and the know, hits. The quote hits. Quote, yeah. I didn't know 80% of all the songs. But, but they were so matter. enjoyable. They were so enjoyable, and everybody was having such a good time. And and there was so much emotion. In I the remember songs she kept singing like... this song about Uncle Jack, uh, uh, something Jack. And I kept thinking of uh, the cereal. What's Apple Jacks? Something Jack. Like whatever. She kept singing about a song that said Jack. <laughs> and I remember when she sang it, the lights were green and red. Oh, so it was like Apple Jacks. Yes, I was thinking of the cereal. <laughs> Uh, on that note ladies and gentlemen note. we hope everybody had a great time <laughs> have a great weekend Beto Friday yes. um, we hope you listened laughed and learned and as always remember to get your patelito your croqueta and your cafecito and thank you for joining us everybody happy Friday happy Beto Friday yes happy Valentine's Day enjoy the long weekend caballero bye bye Pero Let Me Tell You is co-hosted by Darian Borges and Ismaeliano, produced by Ismaeliano, and our theme, Pero Let Me Tell You Freestyle, is composed by Michael Angelo Lomlaplex, the official gay guy. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes.